Welcome to Factorio Masterclass. My name is Nilas. This is the series of tutorials and guides here on YouTube covering all aspects of the game and aims to provide insights and resources to help you improve. In this episode, we are finally dealing with trains and rails and signals. This is such a huge, complex and contested topic that I wanted to prepare really well for it. I've chosen to split this into multiple videos to prevent it from becoming too overwhelming and too long. This one will be focused on getting you started with trains and explaining signals and basics. But for our veteran train enthusiast, I'm sure there will also be a couple of neat tricks. Later on, I'll add another masterclass video for advanced train configurations and tactics based on the feedback for this one. Each of these episodes starts as a workshop session streamed live on my Twitch channel. This is over at twitch.tv slash and you're very welcome to drop by. This usually happens on Mondays at 8 p.m. Central European time, so feel free to drop by and help decide, design, and discuss upcoming guides. If you like this video and this kind of video and want more, then hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. If you have ideas, comments, or feedback, you're very welcome to leave a comment below or join the Discord server or the, during the live stream. In this video, we are going to talk about train configurations, train sizes, the driving side, I will talk about signals and going a bit more into detail on that. And I'll also have a signal challenge for any of the veterans around here. And then we're finally, of course, going to talk about how to schedule trains. So the first thing we should look at is the train configuration. One of the big first decisions you have to take is um, if you have a train, you have a locomotive and you have some wagons, Let's put four wagons in. Are you going to have the train driving only in one direction, which means making loops and going back? Or will you have a locomotive in either direction so that it can go in both directions? Let's put some fuel in so it looks nice. So that's one of the first decisions. So either double headed or single headed trains. Now, I think there would be fair to say that there are different situations where each are necessary. And there's also a big part of it that's uh, that's preference. Let me say, if you are building a single train line, you have a very nice iron deposit somewhere out in the world and you'd like to bring it back to the base, then my recommendation for the very first train would be build a double-headed train because then you only need to make one train line. You don't have to deal with signals or anything like that. It's simply going from A to B and back and forth. Very, very simple. You don't need to deal with any sort of loop arounds or signals or anything like that. That would be a very good case where you can use it. However, you can also use double headed trains for a very advanced setups. However, for anything except for that single back and forth situation, I am having a preference for the one for the single headed trains. The reason why I have a preference for the single headed trains is because they are faster and shorter. Obviously, if this train is carrying a a heavy train here at the back dead weight, it's going to accelerate slower, it's going to move slower. And it's also going to take up more space than a single headed train. So for big train networks, I definitely prefer this. They are faster they, uh, and they are shorter, so they can easier fit into different locations. Signaling, uh, which we will come to, is also much simpler, in my opinion, when it comes to single headed trains, because the trains will only go in one direction on any given track. And the last advantage is about when it comes to train stations. If you have it, this one waiting at a train station, it leaves the same way it came in. So let's uh, for the sake it go, leaves out here, and as soon as it has, the last wagon has left the station, the next tra station, the next train can start rolling in. However, with a double-headed train, it has to leave the same way it came in, and that means the next train for that station has to wait. If there are multiple trains, of course, it has to wait until it has not only cleared the station but also cleared, uh, so the intersection and moved over to over to another track. So my preference is single-headed trains. What I'll do from here is I will only deal with single headed trains. So if you choose to make double headed trains, most of it is still applicable, but there will be specifically the signal will be different. Let's talk about train sizes. So this is what we, what everyone calls a one, one train, one locomotive, one wagon, one, two, one, three, one, four. What kind of size would be beneficial for you? Well, the thing is the shorter train are faster, but of course they can't load as much. If you have, if you have one one trains, then you're going to need four one one trains for each one four train. It's kind of obvious to carry the same amount of resource. That means you will have a lot more trains running around your network. In order to transport the same amount of materials, that means you need more 
management of where they're going to park, where they're going to queue up when they are going somewhere. Uh, there will be a lot of speeding up and slowing down. So generally speaking, the bigger your base, the larger quantities you travel, you, you bring in, the larger the distances, the longer trains you want. Now, my recommendations on train size, and actually, let me use this opportunity to show you another feature. If you see here, I hold a train, you can see here, there are some white markers on the tracks. These white markers indicate how many trains there are. So for example, if I wanted to build a signal, it's actually really nice for me to just get a sense of that one. If I build a signal here, oops, if I build a signal here, then I can fit in one train, one locomotive and four wagons. This is an interface command. So go to settings, go to interface, and you can do the train visualization here. If you want your trains to be two, eight trains, for example, in this case, you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. That's what visualizes. So I can easily see how big it is. That means your default train length, set this parameter here to what you like. I am going to deal mostly with one, four trains. So I'm going to set it to five length. Now, my preferred size of trains is always a power of two. And that means it's either a one, one, very rarely, one, two, a one, four, or a two, eight. The reason why I had two locomotives is because the weight of all these loaded wagons means that one, one locomotive just can't really carry it fast enough. And uh, I found that with the braking speed and nuclear power, nuclear fuel, then this one is quite fast and quite easy to handle two locomotives to, to eight wagons. So that's, that's kind of my size. So when do you want to use each one? Well, let's say that you're moving space science around. It stacks to 2000. So probably you can get a lot of weight, uh, a lot of stuff into one single train. However, if you're moving ore from a remote mining operation, you might want bigger trains. You can also consider whether you always want the same trains or different sizes because you have the signal will depend on different sizes. Now, if you have a base with a lot of materials that are moving around by train inside the base, then smaller trains make sense because there's shorter travel distance and you want to sort of keep up uh, the production. Also, very expensive things like red circuits attack to 200 can you can probably last a while even with a small train, while ore and plates should be coming on bigger trains. So generally, with my bases, I build one four trains or one or two eight trains. Two eight trains are the best ones, in my opinion, for ore deliveries. The reason why I take a power of two as a, as a by power is because of the loading situ uh, unloading and loading situation. When you have a power of two, then we get that here. It's very easy to take stuff being offloaded and balance it immediately. Likewise here on, on this path. I know these don't mind the station. This is just how I build it. And I have different types of stations for different needs. This one is here to illustrate exactly one point, And that is how easy it is to, when you have a power of two, two chests go into one belt, two chests go into one belt. That means four chests go into here, go into one, one belt and you can take anything that divides by two or four or eight is just going to be easier. And here we have a two eight train that's being unloaded. That's why I take things in power of two. So one, one, very rare. One, two, if you have a, a, base, a congested base with lots of trains running around, one, four or one or two, eight for larger quantities and larger distances. The next topic is also a highly contested and not really a rational topic to talk about. And that's the driving side. You need to decide if you have one way, uh, one headed trains, if they are going to drive right hand side, as you have here, or left hand side, the only difference is in your mind. Now the difference functionality wise is that you can see here, if you build the right hand drive, your signals will be on the outside of the belt. While if you put make a left hand drive, your signals will be on the inside of the belt. That can have certain advantages, disadvantages. Let's say you're landfilling across a large lake, then you don't need to make room for these uh, signals on the outside if you do left-hand drive. However, I would say your decision for left-hand, right-hand drive is almost certainly dictated by the country you live in because that's just how you're, you're used to things working. In my case, I'm only doing right-hand 
drive. All my blueprints are right-hand drive. I will never talk about left-hand drive again. That's just the way it is. So that was just uh, something you keep in mind. You can choose however you like, but if you are looking at into my blueprints, then they're all going to be right-hand drive. And now we get to the topic that I know that most people who are worried about trains or not really familiar with trains are getting the most worried about, and that's signals. How do you signal things properly? And what are the rules that you should use when signaling things? And how do you avoid deadlocks? Deadlocks being when trains sort of block each other and they get stuck. So I'm going to start by posing a challenge for any of you veteran players or anyone who just feels like, yeah, you know what? I think I understand signals. Here is a very basic T intersection. I encourage you to pause the video and uh, just look at this one and see how many signals and what kind of signals you would want to put in. Then we're going to go through the signals and then come back to this one and see if, uh, if uh, you and I are agreeing on how many signals we should do. So give it a shot. Now here we have a test intersection I have made uh, that we're going to use this one for our, our working with signals and just trying to explain it from here. The first thing is a little trick that uh, I don't think necessarily a lot of people know. And if you press F4, you go into what is called the debug settings. It sounds a lot scarier than it is. This is not a scary setting. But if you go to the one that's called show signals, show rail signal states. If we go to the map, you can see now I have signal states. If I check this out, this is the normal. If I do this, you actually have the signals on the map. I would encourage you when working with trains to do this, unless you're building very big bases. It, some will feel that it's disruptive to the overview on, uh, on the map, but I really like it. It gives you a good idea about how big an area a train actually blocks when it moves around your base. And it, it also kind of looks nice with flashing lights. I mean, it looks nice. Uh, but however, be aware that there is a quite significant performance gap uh, performance here. So as your base grows, definitely you have to take it off. But you can see that when the game starts slowing down because of because of drawing this but i mean it's uh, really helpful to to figure out what's going on so i would recommend actually using this for for learning about signals there are two types of signals normal signals real signals and change signals we are going to start by ignoring change signals and just imagine just explain the con the concept if we look at put a train here now you can see some of the some of the uh, rail signals already change color. Now, if we hold a signal in hand, then the interface changes. You can see that now there's an overlay. This pink area is what is called one block in train terminology. So actually the signals are only there as delimitations of the, I would call it an object, the object being the block. And if I put another signal here, then this becomes a block. And when a train is in a block, it the block is closed and any signal leading into the block will be turned off. So you can see now these are open. All the other ones are open. It's only this one that's closed because this is the only th way that you can go into this block. The block being the yellow line. If I take it out, then the block now consists of all of these integrations here. And that you can obviously say that this is a problem because that means as soon as one train is in here, the next train coming from up here has to stop right there because there is a train in here. So we don't want that. What we'd really like to do is make sure that before going into an intersection, we want to block it off and just go, going, okay, you don't go into the intersection if you don't have to. And at this point, this is good. I can also do it from the other sides. Let's try doing the same length there and there. Again, only do right-hand drive. So in this case, this looks good. Let's look at what this blocks look like. Now on the inside, we can get really close to the train, to the signal here. And here it'll stop and the other train has green this way. So it can actually just drive through. This one can drive through. This one can drive through. No problems while this one is waiting. For example, if there is another train there, then it will stop. No, if there's another train, there, then it will stop here. So that's kind of how a train signal work. However, what if there is another train here? Or 
let's uh let's say this one's going in another chain comes in it drives through and it's here oh, that was funny it is a one four train because there's a signal here and there's another chain that's parked right there so this chain's parked here this one is kindly waiting here and then it's asses hanging into this the signal and thereby blocking everything. This is what causes deadlocks. When you have only yes, normal signals, you will get very often get deadlocks because things will just get stuck inside, inside here. So that is what we want to prevent. We want simply want to say, you know what? Don't go into the, don't go into the signal unless you can also go out. And that's where chain signals comes in. Chain signals is basically replicating this next signal. That's all it does. So now I replaced the normal signal with the rain signal. That means this signal will repeat what the next signal is. That means if I place the train here, this one is just repeating what's over here. And that means it's blocking me from entering this block here because, because of that one. So how do we, we can do that quite handily like this. Actually, I think I want these to be uh, just a tiny bit closer. I think that was a point to actually make them as close as possible. Yeah. There. Because now, at this point, if the train is over here, then it's allowed to go all the way through here. Go up here, and then our four train wagons, don't do three, four. And this is where that one comes in handy. You want to make sure that the signals are making enough room so that you can have a full train here. If this signal was that location, I would have still have problems because even if this one was blocked, my train says the chain signal is open because the next signal is open and my train can go through four. This is why you kind of have to decide how big your trains are up front because you need to place signals so that they can clear entire locations. So having, even if you have chain signals or normal signals too close to each other, you have to make sure that there is room afterwards so that it can actually clear the intersection. So the correct way to intersect, to signal this would be to say on the way in, you make a chain signal. Let's make it on the way in chain signal and on the way out, you make normal signals. And you have to make sure that on the other side of the rail signal, there is sufficient room for a full train length. This also means that this is one of the disadvantages of having long trains is that you need to have more space all the way around. This one is a potential conflict. Um, have more room around your intersections. That means it if you have a compact base where trains are moving around a lot, then you have to have shorter trains because you simply do not have room for those long trains to be fully clearing an intersection. So let's look at what it looks like. Now we have the entire intersection here is one block. Well, that's actually not super useful because that means as I am moving through this block, I'm actually also preventing a train coming up here from just going straight through. And that, that's not really beneficial, is it? So what if I just put some signals in the middle here? Now I can have, while this chain is going through the intersection, another train can go on the northern bound, the other side here. So this is the correct way to, to signal it so that trains can go in parallel and they don't block each other. So I've tried to formulate some kind of rules for you to understand. And when you're building, you're initiating your own base, what are the rules that you want to to keep in mind in order to make signals correctly. I've heard some things, uh, rules of thumb, and I don't like them because they're actually going to get you in trouble. So I'm going to try it my own way. Basically, the rule is you should use normal signals as a default. However, the rule is that after a normal signal, you must have room for a full train length afterwards in the next block. So for example, this one can be a normal signal because after this one, there is a block and that block can contain a full train. This one, could that be a normal signal? 
No, because this because the block following it is the turquoise one, and that one cannot keep a full train. Therefore, it must be a must be a chain signal. If you follow that rule, you might put a few too many signals, but you will definitely not make signals incorrectly. So basically, every time you put you consider to put in a normal signal, you should get, you should look after that normal signal and see can I fit in my a full train of the longest trains that I'm gonna have on this track. If yes, you can put down a normal signal. If no, that has to be a chain signal. So I hope that helped. Uh, regarding signal states, there are another uh, there are kind of a different way as well. There are some cases where there you can see here now you have a blinking signal. What does that mean? Well, this blinking signal just tells you that it's not doing anything. This is unresolved. It has not. It is not able to split into separate blocks. As soon as I do this, then it it is able to split it into at least saying a left and a right block. But at this point, the block is the same no matter if you place it here. So this doesn't do anything. Therefore, it's blinking and has served no purpose. The other signal that I I've built a little case for is here. This is a blue signal. It only happens on chain signals. And basically on a blue signal, if we build a train at this location, here, the blue signal means that w it has several paths out, but one of them, or they're not all the same. If they're all green, like if they're all red, this is gonna be a red signal. If they're all green, this is gonna be a green signal. But if some are red and some are green, then it becomes blue. The interesting thing about the blue here is that I have a train station here that's called one and another one's called two. If I schedule this to go to one, we'll go to schedule in a second. It'll stop. If I schedule it to go into two, it'll go there. So the change signal is actually being selective on what it blocks and not. And that's the power of the blue signal. So you can have blue signals that lead into an array of different locations and it'll only block the ones that lead into red, but that means you can't you can't know if a blue signal will stop your train or not unless you know where it's going. Now let's revisit our challenge to see if uh, we can apply what we learned here and make this as efficiently as possible to do it, and also with a dash of aesthetics to it. So this is right-hand drive. That means I'm coming in here. It can either go right or left. Likewise, here it comes. Go straight ahead or turn left, or here turn right or go straight ahead. So the way I usually try to signal things, because um, when you build big intersections, it gets really complicated. So the way I try to keep in mind is that I want to say, I want to, I want to start from one location and then follow the tracks through so that I make sure that all the tracks through for this particular lane is actually signals. Let's go through it. This one goes all the way over here and I'm going to put a signal in there. Because I know that there will also be something here, and that means I'm going to assume that the block out here will be sufficient big. Now this one doesn't do anything yet. And basically what we can do is we can always just go, I think I want to make normal signal here, and I want to make a normal signal here, and then I can already see this can't be a normal signal according to our rules, because the block following, this is blinking because it hasn't been defined quite as a block, this one has to be a normal signal because after that, the next stretch here will definitely not fit in, fit in a full train. This one though, I can fit in a full train here. So that's coming from the south. Let's go come here from the east. The options, it goes through. And if I do that, yeah. So now I have more distinct blocks. There's one distinct block here, there's one distinct block here, and then everything else is one block. Now let's do the round around to go through here. I'll definitely want one here, but that one cannot be a normal signal because the path afterwards up to the next signal is not long enough. And that's basically, then it's free and out. Now let's do the last one. It comes from here, turns right, and I'm gonna put it here. And that means at this point, it goes. These two go into this block and it looks good. Now, if I want to go straight ahead, again, I want to block it so that right now all the yellow one is actually meaning that as soon as a train comes in here, there is no intersections any other way. I want to make sure that the train could go turn right 
and also come here and turn left at the same time or go straight through. And uh, that would require us to build a signal there and there. However, that one, the yellow block in between is not big enough to fit a full signal. So that has to be a change signal leading in so that it clears it. And there you have it. Let's look at it. The main, the main point is that you want to make, when you have a signal, an, an intersection like this, you want to make sure that things do not block unnecessarily. Of course, when you cross cut across a track, you will block anything here, but you don't want to be, have a situation where when you make a turn here, it also blocks that turn. Or if you make a turn here, then it blocks the straight ahead or that one or that one. So you want to leave as many parallel tracks open as possible. And this is basically just every time there's an intersection, we make it here. There's one thing that I'm, I'm sure you're already, some of you are already typing away is why are you not, why am I not doing this thing because some people have been taught that you do chain intersections into an intersection and normal on the outside on the way out of an intersection that's kind of a rule of thumb what is the difference here what is the difference between this one and the one i had before well the only thing is that the train will stop here until that one is clear and it'll stop here until it can completely clear this area. Well, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter. If I take this out, there's nothing, if, as long as this one comes out, if this one goes in here and it's it's stuck at a location such as this, then it's still blocking that lane anyway. So there's no point in making sure that it, it merges completely into, into the lane. But the advantage is that now it can actually go, the intersection is smaller. And the smaller your intersection is, the faster trains can clear it. That means you need less space between intersections to fit in the whole train. This is particularly important if with longer trains that you want to make sure that they stay inside an intersection for as short as possible and they go out and go into blocks that are delimited by normal signals. So this is, in my opinion, the best way to, to signal this the answer was six normal signals and three chain signals. Not very much. Of course, if you really want to optimize, you can make these like really close to the intersections here, but then you lose some aesthetic. And I like the fact that there's aesthetic. That's kind of a triangle here. Uh, I'd prefer that and moving it one tile over for a minuscule improvement is not worth it. Have you ever had, did you get it right? Do you have comments? Do you think there's anything wrong with it? Let me know in the comments on this one. Now that's a lot of the infrastructure on how to build tracks, but what about actually scheduling? Well, before we dive into the scheduling, I just want to take a moment to thank all the, the fantastic patrons who are supporting the channel. Without uh, you patrons, it would not be possible for me to continue to do these kind of videos, this uh, factorial content every single day, both on Twitch and on YouTube. So thank you very much for supporting the channel. If you want to support, Patreon is the best way to do it. So. Thank you very much. There is a link in the description, but there is obviously no obligation of any kind. I just very much appreciate it. So thank you very much. Okay, so now that we have, um, we understand how trains work, how big trains we want, uh, how signals work, what about actually making the trains go automatically? Well, that's kind of where scheduling comes in. And I have built a little very simple track. It is here. So the way you work, you build a train schedule is they are linked to the trains, not as a separate object that you assign to trains. It is not assigned to locomotives. It is assigned to a full train in and of itself. So that's really uh, something to keep in mind. So if you want well, the same schedule on multiple trains, there is a trick to it, but we can, we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's uh, click it and then we open it. And this is where you build your, your schedule. So as soon as you open, you will see that the stations here in the list, all the stations will have different colors. These colors are very meaningful. It's a very nice feature here. You have a search bar. bar. The white ones are available from the current train location. The red ones are not available. Stop is inaccessible from current position. Perfect. And the blue one is one out of two stops are inaccessible. So I made this one. I have refueling, but I also have another station called refueling that's not accessible. So we can get the different colors. Now, the first thing you want to do is, well, let's go to our loading station and 
you'd say, okay, let's go to our unloading station. Well, that's the schedule, but we need to know the condition where it leaves. And this is how it works. You basically say, go to the station. And then if you don't add any condition, then it'll just go there and move again. So it'll just literally just slow down. And as soon as it'll slow down, it'll leave again. So we need to say, what are you waiting for at the loading station? And then we open the conditions here. There are a number of these. In this case, because it is a basic tutorial, we are only going to deal with time passed, inactivity, full load and empty load. Those are the ones that we are going to deal with. So what we would like to do at our loading station is we'd like to load it until it's full. And then we'd like to go to the unloading until it's empty. And once I have built the schedule, I can click it over to automatic or I can hit one of these play buttons and then it'll send to that location. It was already loaded, so now it goes to our unloading station where it unloads. Don't mind these, these are some magic chests that will do some stuff for us. And once it's done unloading, you can hover over here, it's done, and then it'll go back to the loading location and fill up again. Now, you can actually add more stations. Let's put it to manual. I can add another station. For example, if I want to have a refueling station where it goes in, I can now drag them around and put the refueling since it's between these two, I'm going to put it, so it goes loading, refueling, unloading. This is where one of the other conditions come in. So you can't really do like full cargo. That doesn't make any sense. You can do an activity by, let's say an activity for two seconds. That means it'll go there. And if nothing has happened to the train for two seconds, then it leaves. Nothing has happened, could be loading, unloading. It also includes loading of fuel. So let's uh, let's try this and see how it works. Goes in, gets loaded, and then waits two seconds until it's done loading, and then it moves on. And then we can start unloading again. And when it goes the next round, it will still go there for two seconds because it just has to go there and wait for two seconds just to check, am I getting loaded something? No, I'm not, and then move on. Now, if you have a, let's take you off there. If this is not a fancy a location as this one, which uh, can just magically load everything all the time, what if it's not really delivering as much as you'd like? This is just what your mining facility can do. Well, you might want to have it load until it's full. You can see here how full it is. If you click here, you can see this bar progressing and it's like, you know what? What if I don't want to wait for this? I instead want to say, what if it's either when the train has waited, is full, or it has waited for 30 seconds. And you can see the waiting for 30 seconds goes faster, and then it'll it'll depart when either of these conditions are met. You can also click this one, and then it'll turn into an end condition, so that both conditions must be met. You can make this as complicated as you want, where you basically say it has to be unloaded in this case, and idle, you can see here it restarts. I can't really see the reason why you'd want this one and unload it. Then it just waits here for five seconds after it's done. And then it, it'll send out to the next one. So you can start combining and conditioned or conditions. In this case, you can see the loading. The waiting time is this loading is just not keeping up but maybe you want to make sure that the trains don't get stuck there if the mine mining patch runs out and it's just all right if you've been there for two minutes just come back already so those are kind of the basic schedules you can make and uh, you can if you want to have multiple schedules that are the same let's build another let's actually just do oops copy this part and then say okay i don't want that i'm gonna build a train here one two three four and you know what? I want it to be exactly the same as the other one, but I can't remember all the conditions. Then you can shift, right click, shift, left click, and then you copy paste it. Similar to how you copy paste between other entities, shift, right click to copy, shift, left click to paste. And then you have it, it starts in manual and you can hit it to automatic. And there is actually no problem, as we saw also here, there's no problem having stations with the same name. It'll just route to the one that is closest. 
The last thing I want to show you here is what is called a temporary schedule. So what you can do is when you're in this view, you can hold control and click somewhere on the tracks like this, and then it inserts a temporary stop, which it will immediately go to and wait for five seconds. Then once the five seconds are gone, it'll remove the stop and resume the schedule as normal. This is this has two purposes in my opinion. It is great when you have a train that you're driving and you want to send it specific places. Uh, the other thing is if you are having a, some kind of deadlock, then you can take a train and go in, even from the map view, just open the train and just send it somewhere else. And then you can usually, sometimes at least, re, uh, clear up the deadlock. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's the last little feature I wanted to highlight here. And that is basically the, what I want to cover in this basic tutorial on trains. I don't want it to go way too long. We've been focusing on three things, the configuration of trains, the signaling and how to do proper signaling, as well as the scheduling. So with those things, you are now ready to start implementing trains in your own base. And when you, when you feel you want to take the next step with a large train network, this is not really for a train network. This is just to get trains up and running and making them work. Then I will also have a future tutorial, future masterclass video that will cover or more advanced things. Some of the things I'm planning is like network planning, design and blueprints, uh, using circuits to open close stations, stackers, when to use them and when not to use them, limitations of the implementations uh, of the way that trains are implemented, such as many to many networks and the thundering herd issues, and also managing multiple stations with the same name in clever ways. So those are really more advanced things that you want if you are building a large train network, but it doesn't belong in the first video because I need you to understand how trains work. And I hope I might made it clear. If there's something that isn't clear, be sure to leave a comment below. I am reading all of these. And if there's something I'm missing, then we're going to include it somewhere else. Uh, maybe a follow up if there are too many things I, uh, I have missed in this tutorial or some things that I've just not clear enough yet. So if you are still here, the seven people still uh, awake, then uh, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It's uh, still about uh, half of the people watching these videos who are not subscribed. So do consider subscribing because there will be more masterclass videos, more Let's Plays, more of everything. And if you want to be part of the design process, then head on over to Twitch. It's Twitch TV slash Nilaus. I'm streaming. Let's Plays, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays at 8 p.m. Central European time. And I'm streaming workshops where we do preparations and design and discussions about and discoveries of new things uh, as part of uh, the preparation for the masterclass videos. That's on Mondays at 8 p.m. Central European time. So I hope to see you either here on YouTube, on Twitch, or maybe on the Discord channel. Thank you for watching. And as always, stay effective.